So the gospel lesson comes from Mark's gospel. This is in the middle of the gospel as the disciples have made a conscious decision to move to Jerusalem. So this is a reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Listen to God's word today. James and John, sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Jesus said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? And they replied, Yes, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or my left hand is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now when the ten other disciples heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must become your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you play a note on the piano, you hear a tone that consists of vibrations of a particular frequency, and we then have given a name to that level of vibration. C, E flat, G sharp. If you pick two notes, and you play them together, now the vibrations interact. Now some pairs of notes vibrate as if they were always meant to be together, but other pairs of notes vibrate in such a way that the sound produces tension. The tension's not necessarily ugly or unpleasant, but it's a tension that wants to resolve, it wants to go somewhere. And the minor seventh interval is just like that. Once it's played, it can't just sit there. It has to go somewhere. Now maybe it'll go to a happy major chord or to a more melancholy minor chord. But in musical terms, we say that the interval of the minor seventh has to resolve. That's just part of what it is. In all of our lives, there are moments when we do something that sets in motion something else. It's an act that creates a tension that must be resolved. You're out on a date, currently or in your younger version, and you lean in for a kiss. Now you can't hold that posture forever. So something has to happen. Either there will be a kiss that's reciprocated, or there will be a turned aside face to greet you, but something happens next. Other examples. You're called into an office and you're offered a job. While the offer stands there, you have to choose how to respond. Do you accept that offer and go down a new path? Or do you reject that offer and set in motion a different path? Or a relationship reaches a point where it simply cannot continue as it has been. Do you stay and work things out? Or do you pack your bags and make the difficult choice to move on? Once long ago, Jesus was walking along by the Sea of Galilee when he saw a pair of brothers near the water's edge, and they were mending their nets in their father's boat. And Jesus called out to them and said, Follow me. Those two words hung in the air like a minor seventh interval, and they required some sort of resolution. Either James and John would stay right where they were and continue to work as fishermen, 
Or they would step into the shallow water out of the boat and follow where this young, compelling rabbi might lead them. In this case, the resolution of the tension was a literal resolution. The brothers resolved at that point that they would follow Jesus. And no matter what, even when the path led to hardship or rejection or even a cross, they would stay by his side. And that's where our gospel lesson for today picks up the story. James and John have been beside Jesus since almost day one. They have seen wonderful things and miraculous things, but some part of Jesus' message just hasn't fully sunk in. For example, Jesus had just finished telling the disciples for the third time that they were heading to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem he would be arrested and condemned, mocked, and killed. And on the third day, he would rise again. Right after that pronouncement from Jesus, as they're still walking down the road, James and John decide this is a good time to sidle up next to Jesus and ask a favor. And so they say, Teacher, when you are glorified, when you come in power, let us sit on either side of you. Now once the request was made, it hung out there in the air like an unresolved minor seventh. And something had to come next. Once the other disciples realized what James and John had asked, they got angry at they perceived this act of disloyalty and a power grab by the two brothers. The sons of Zebedee may have known Jesus a long time, but that didn't give them a right to ask for special positions of power above others. But in that moment, Jesus doesn't rebuke them. Jesus simply is honest with them and says, you don't know what you're asking. Because what is to come is not actually what you expect. It's not a scene from a palace. It is not about glory and thrones. It's not about cups of gold, but a cup of suffering. It's not about a baptism that refreshes and anoints like a rare perfume, but instead a baptism in deep waters that is literally almost like a drowning. Jesus said, the resolution of your request will be different than you think. But James and John said, they are willing to drink that cup and accept that baptism. But it's clear they don't fully know what's ahead for them. And so where are we in this story? Think of the times you agreed to something only to discover that you signed up for far more than you bargained for. Imagine you said yes to a new assignment at work. Imagine you said yes to join a committee. Yes, even a church committee. And somehow the time and work demands were far greater than you anticipated. Remember when you might have said yes to a marriage proposal, when you brought home a new baby. In that moment, you don't truly know all that's going to be required of you. And you may actually ask yourself later, what have I gotten myself into? Am I equal to this challenge? We all have doubts and worries at some point, but in most cases, by grace, we figure it out. We see it through. We make a resolution to keep going forward. Many years ago, on a Monday night football game between the Chicago Bears and the New York Giants, one of the announcers commented that the great running back, Walter Payton, in that game had just accumulated over nine miles of career rushing yardage, to which the other announcer wisely noted, yes, and that's with someone knocking him down every 4.6 yards. James and John weren't bad disciples. They'd been beside Jesus even when he'd been rejected and knocked down. They'd stayed beside him even as he was heading towards an obvious time of confrontation in Jerusalem. They were loyal. They were committed. They had resolved to follow wherever Jesus led. And that's why... Jesus' answer to them wasn't angry or chastising. 
He gave an answer that was intended to comfort them and frankly, is intended to comfort us. Jesus first asked if they can drink from the same cup from which he will drink. Now remember, Jesus wasn't wealthy. The cups he drank from weren't made from gold. They were probably common clay or wood at best. He'd been given water from a ladle by a woman beside a well in a town of Samaria. He'd had occasional meals with wealthy hosts, but most of the time he had cupped his hands and drank the water from streams and freshwater pools in the land of Galilee. He'd been dusty, he'd been tired, he'd been rejected, he'd been mocked, he'd had crowds exhaust him with their demands, and soon he would share one more cup with his friends in an upper room, with friends who would in many cases deny or betray or at least abandon him. He would drink a cup that he would even pray that it might pass from him, but a cup from which he resolved that he would drink no matter what. And the man he's speaking to, James, well, James became the very first Christian martyr. So Jesus knew that he would also drink from this cup. He might not sit on a throne in glory, but his life and witness would be an example for generations to come. And then Jesus spoke about baptism. And all the disciples had seen baptizing as had been done by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. This splashing down in the flowing waters, a dunking beneath the waves, a symbolic drowning followed by a sputtering reemergence into the light. It was meant to be a bold act, a risky act, and a dramatic act. But it was meant to be even more than that. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome in chapter 6 and said this, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by God's glory, so we too might walk in newness of life. So many churches today are quick to present the gospel as a no-risk offer, as a pathway to respectability, as an insurance card against anything that's problematic. But following Jesus, by definition, is meant to be problematic. Faith is counter-cultural on many levels. It speaks up when others would remain silent. It advocates when others would acquiesce to the status quo. It challenges a mentality of power over and offers instead a servant mentality of power with, with those on the margins, with those who are oppressed or rejected due to long lists of reasons whether age or gender or race or economic status, whether because of where they live or where they work or don't work or what language they speak. The church is meant to be something that stirs the waters. As Walter Brueggemann has said, the church tells the truth in a society that lives in illusion. The church grieves in a society that practices denial. And the church proclaims hope in a society that lives in despair. Now consider the baptisms we witness today. Should we have warned Eleni of what she's gotten herself into? No. Because baptism into Christ is not just a baptism into his death. As Paul says, we've been baptized with Christ so that just as he was raised from the dead by God's glory, we too may walk in newness of life. So all of this, the cup we drink, at times bitter, at times refreshing, the baptism we receive, whether a sprinkling that anoints or a literal drowning that challenges, All of these acts move us forward by God's grace and Christ's love. They are minor seven moments that vibrate, that resonate with attention, that forces us to go forward by faith into a gift 
a newness of life. So seriously, consider the baptisms that you've witnessed in your life. Remember a young girl surrounded by her family in a church where this sacrament has been done literally hundreds of times, near a table where communion cups have been served hundreds and hundreds of times. And know that everyone who drank from that communion cup or stepped up to that baptism font signed up for more than they could imagine at the time. And yet still we come forward because where else could we possibly go? In Christ, there is life. With Christ, there is strength to get back up when knocked down. And through Christ, there is justice and there is joy and there is hope for us and for all humanity. By God's grace, things resolve for the best. Believe the good news. Amen.